Uh, first, before we start, I uh, uh, give a special thank you to Gemini Middle School and uh, School Board President Alexander Lee. I came here a couple months ago and had a meeting with a group of, uh, of the middle schoolers. I, I will tell you, I left, just to set the bar high, the questions these young people asked were among the best questions anyone's asked before. This is coming and going. Can you hear me if I just yes. try Yes, yes, yes. What did you say? <laughs> Raise your hand in the back if you can't hear me. Um, but anyway, we, we, had the, we had the best group of questions. It, it was extraordinary to talk to these young people. And better than their questions were their follow-up questions. It really was a conversation. So whatever you guys are doing here, you found the magic uh, uh, button. And, and these kids are, are really learning. And what a, what a moment in history to be coming into adulthood, the, the critical thinking ages that middle school provides, at what, when these young people send their kids to school, this is what's going to be in the history books. And this is one of those moments in history uh, that uh, I, I think we're, we're living it, but uh, generations will be studying it. And my guess is they'll, they'll be scratching their heads just as much as So my goal today, more than anything else, is to uh, really have a conversation, open up for questions, so I, I don't have a, a prepared speech. Normally when we do these, I, I've come back from a week in Washington, I can talk about uh, some of the things that happened in Washington. I've been home this week uh, for a 4th of July holiday. It's been anything but a holiday, even on the 4th of July, as mentioned earlier, someone's here from Vernon Hills. I started my day, normally I start in Vernon Hills at the parade, they start gathering at uh, 8, 8.30, the parade starts at 9, and it's a, a day full of parades. Uh, I'm so grateful to my team here, and thank you. They found a pancake um, breakfast I could go to at 7 o'clock. <laughs> uh, we did a pancake breakfast, five parades, and I finished with an uh, opportunity to meet some Gold Star families at Great Lakes Naval Base. And uh, these are the families that have lost someone. Uh, the if you see someone with a Gold Star, it means they've lost someone uh, while serving in our military. And these families are, are truly remarkable. And one of the families had their uh, pens stolen. They, their home was uh, burglarized, and they, well, among the things they took were their, their gold stars. And with the admiral responsible for recruiting, uh, we were able to give the mother and father um, new gold stars. So that's my vacation. And, and quite honestly, it was a great day, but it's been busy. While Washington has been on vacation, the world has continued. We've been watching what's going on uh, with the G20 and still processing that. Uh, so I'll, I'll uh, deflect the question and just touch on that uh, briefly. We don't know exactly what happened with the meeting with uh, our president, President Trump, and uh, Vladimir Putin. There are conflicting stories that will evolve over time. Obviously, a, a grave concern. He uh, did meet, I was reading before I got here, he had a meeting with Theresa May and said it was a very, very big meeting with big, big things to come out of it. Very, very important. And I'm not making this up. This is where the quotes are we're coming out. Um, and so me, the, mo the most disturbing, this was in the New York Times this morning, that with the G20, once the uh, indispensable nation, I guess that wasn't their term, that was my term, but once at the center of things, the United States finds itself kind of on the sideline. And as I look at the world, I'm on the Foreign Affairs Committee. I believe the United States is safer and more secure. The world is safer and more secure when the United States it leans in, engages, is um, working with our allies, uh, standing up to our advers adversaries, and, and at the same time looking for opportunities where possible to coordinate and, and move things forward uh, with all nations. And so I'm very concerned about that. That is my focus on foreign affairs. I'm also on the Judiciary Committee. I asked for that committee because that's where we focus on immigration. Innovation, intellectual property, if we're going to grow our economy, we need to innovate. It's also the committee where uh, gun safety legislation will ultimately pass through if we ever get anything on there. Uh, so that's my second committee. My third committee is small business. I'm going to ask for that committee because I know our economy grows when small businesses have confidence or are thriving. Uh, we've seen a, a comparatively uh, strong economy the last couple of years. Uh, when I first got to Congress the first time in 2013, one of the things we talked a lot about was small businesses were not <coughs> feeling the, the uplift, feeling the, the, the wind at their back, if you would. It's the first time this recession from 2008, 2009, the recovery out of it is the first time 
that the small businesses haven't led the recovery, but they've lagged. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but among those is the lack of certainty of policy coming out of both Washington, but also in states, and, and Illinois can lead that uh, charge in the uncertainty coming from the states. Small businesses, they need access to capital. They need quality ac access to quality talent, but they also need a stable environment where they can make decisions because family-owned, closely held small businesses are the first to make the de decision I can wait. I can wait a month. I can wait six months. I can wait a year. I'm not going to take imprudent risk, and uh, that's what we've seen. So my goal in small business is to help create the opportunities for small businesses to grow, and so that's the three areas of uh, committee work I do. Of course, we are involved with everything in Congress, taking votes. That, by way of introduction, let me open it up. My goal, as I said, is really to be here and have a conversation and hear what's important to you. So we're welcome to take any questions, and uh, Sarah has a microphone. Uh, I will ask that you stand up and um, tell me your name again. And, uh, My name is Bob Goldberg. And I'm going to shift a little bit. Uh, I have two questions, but I'll let the others ask first. Um, you're an elected official, and I brought a card. I thought you wouldn't do cards, but so I'll just read it. Uh, you're an elected official at the federal level. But you're still a resident and a voter here in Illinois. What's your spin and your thought from your level as to the state of the state? Vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Democrats versus Republicans, vis-a-vis -vis the goings on with the veto pen, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you, you uh, took away part of my answer in the beginning of the question. I get asked this all the time, obviously. People want to know what's happening with the state. And I say, let me take off my elected official hat and speak as a voter. Because I am a voter here, here in Illinois. And I'm very concerned about it. I'm concerned about what's been happening in the state for a while. So I'm going to tell a quick story. I'll give you my opinion, and I'll finish with the story. Uh, but the quick story is uh, about my kids. I have two boys, 24 and 22. And they're no different than most of the kids their generation. What bothers me is that neither one has any inclination to come back to Chicago to move back to Illinois, because they see what's going on, they see the struggles, and they say that this is, I'm gonna, you know, they wanna sow their oats, that's fine, but I want our state to be a magnet to bring young people back, not just my kids, but all kids. Why is that important? Because when our kids come back, we're closer to our grandkids. How many of you have grandkids? I don't, but I'm told they're the greatest thing in oh history. Oh my God. <laughs> oh Lord. Yeah, so I, I'm told that they're wonderful. What I do know is talking to many people who say they're looking at leaving to the state, I say, where are you going? And they tell me more often than not, that they're moving closer to their grandchildren. So if we want Illinois to continue to prosper, to continue to grow, we need to make sure that our young people come back to have their kids here so that our grandparents stay here. It's a, it's a virtuous circle. And so I, I'm very concerned about the dynamics happening in the state, about the, the fact that um, we are seeing a decline in population. That decline in population leads to a decline in influence, by the way, at the federal level. When I got here, I came here for college in 1979, we had 22 congressional districts in Illinois. We've lost one every single census. There's a possibility in 2022 we could lose two to go from 18 to 16. That's a loss of influence in, in, in setting policy and, and establishing priorities. So I'm very concerned about it. We need to have stability. It's important for our businesses. I talked about that uh, a moment ago. And the uncertainty, the lack of budget, has certainly put businesses at risk. In particular, these small businesses that do work with the state or do work with agencies that do work, work, work with the state, they're not getting paid. We're $15 billion in arrears um, to these service providers, uh, people that rely, and that, that's our communities. Uh, it's affecting the ability for our communities to invest in their own infrastructure, whether that's roads, schools, whatever you want to talk about, which again, if we're going to have a stronger state, we always have to be looking towards stronger communities. So I'm very concerned about it. I think we need to address it. The problems we have achieved are bipartisan. We didn't get here because of Republicans or because of Democrats. Both parties were complicit in, in achieving the, the troubles we face as a state, not over a couple of years, but truly over decades. And the solutions are not going to be simple. The choices are not going to be easy. But we've got to come up with solutions and make hard choices in a bipartisan way. And I think you saw a glimmer of that with the budget 
that was passed this uh, last couple of days. Right? There were a number of Republicans who broke with their leadership. There were also a number of Democrats who challenged their leadership and said, we've got to find a, a way through. I was personally disappointed that the governor vetoed it. This was a compromise deal that had both Republican and Democratic support. I think as we go forward, this was a step. The way I look at it is it took Illinois from our knees to our feet. <laughs> But until we start putting one step in front of the other, we've got a long way to go, and we're coming from a long way behind. And it's not going to be easy, and that's why I said I'll finish with the story. Uh, my oldest son is 24 when he was looking at colleges in 2010, 2011. He wanted to go to California, and he said you can't apply to the state schools in California because you may remember at that time, California was in worse shape than Illinois even, and it was really struggling. But they elected a governor, the governor worked with the legislature, they made some hard choices, and in a relatively short period of time, California has gone from worst to near first in, in many areas. We have everything California has. We have great schools, we have great businesses, we have a great workforce. Lake Michigan is, is a resource, the transportation hub. Chicago is a wonderful city. Illinois with opportunities for agriculture, for industry. If we start, now that we're up on our feet, I hope, we're starting to take the decisions to move us forward, there's no reason we can't be back in the, as one of the leading states in our nation in a comparatively short time. But it's going to take both parties coming together. So that's my citizen's response. Where did your son go to? <laughs> Where did he go so he to? wanted to go to California, and in the end he ended up in New Hampshire. And you know, now he's in the Navy visiting his girlfriend in California, but he's based in Hawaii. He's got a pretty good life. <laughs> Let me wait for the microphone. Okay. Tian 从中国来的一些投资者，recently many Chinese investors are coming to Chicago. 想在芝加哥做一些投资，they want to find some business opportunity in Chicago. 请问政府部门有没有一个为他们提供一些方便、咨询、服务，甚至一帮助？To provide any connecting resources or information. Uh, for those Chinese investors in the future, if they want to come to Chicago and connect them to the right people, the right opportunities, do you have this kind of service in the future? We have been hosting for some Chinese business people uh, in the last few years. My second question is, I also develop a local ethnic church, uh, for example, like Chinese Korean Church in mm -hmm. Langville. Does your office also have any support plan for the ethnic church in the future to develop to bless the community in a better way? Okay. Um, Thank you so much. So just to repeat the questions, two questions. First one was about uh, Chinese companies looking to do business in Chicago, yeah, exactly. making connections. Second question was outreach to ethnic uh, church communities. Yes, how is any supportive plan for the local ethnic church to do that in, in the uh, Penn District? Yeah. Okay, um, <coughs> great. Thank you. Let, let me talk about the business uh, uh, aspects of it. So the actual efforts at promoting direct connections with businesses and uh, opportunities here, um, doesn't fall on the legislature, one to one. There are opportunities both within the city of Chicago, the state of Illinois, and, and the federal government. In the city of Chicago, there's uh, the mayor's office, obviously. He's also got a group called World Business Chicago, which I would suggest reaching out to and, and connecting. They can help with. And, and obviously, the, the, com the community leaders, the, the mayors and, and village presidents in all of our towns. I know in Waukegan, for example, uh, the mayor, the previous mayor, and I'm sure the, the, the new mayor, Sam Cunningham, uh, 
will work with it as well. Is working with some of these other organizations in Waukegan is the Greater Waukegan Development Corporation, who have established connections. What we have done on a, a number of occasions and, and may seek the opportunity to do again is to create resource fairs. Uh, we, we have job fairs where we bring in employers, match with employees. We also have had um, uh, work done work with the Export Import Bank, uh, trying to create connections with uh, companies around the world. But at the federal level, the, the Department of Commerce uh, works with it, and there are agencies and they have offices uh, around the country, and that's a, a, a place to reach out. So my responsibility, my colleagues in, in the legislature, is to work to identify policies that will promote, uh, grow our economy, and I, I believe growing our economy is important to reach out to the global economy. Uh, and in particular, working with smaller businesses, uh, many small businesses have, may have a customer outside the United States, but don't necessarily have export programs. As a member of the Small Business Committee, we are promoting and, and trying to create policies that will help the Small Business Administration help businesses, help small businesses um, take maybe one customer and turn it into a market, one market and turn it into a platform for entering into other markets. And, and really, my ultimate goal, invent things here, make things here and ship them around the world and working with that. So th those are some of the things that we're happy to try to make some connections. Um, with respect to uh, the, um, the ethnic churches in our community, so the 10th district is extraordinarily diverse. Uh, I did not realize until recently, so I, I knew um, that our district's about 22% Latino. And the district, just to describe it, goes from, we're at the southern tip here, we go all the way up and touch Wisconsin border. Uh, I often joke, the 10th district represents the space between Janice Schakowsky on the south and Paul Ryan on the north, both <laughs> figuratively and literally. <laughs> but so there's about 22% Latino. There are estimates that it is 12% Asian Pacific Islander. It is uh, estimated to be 6 to 8% African American. There's a large Greek community, a, a Serbian community. Uh, people, literally, uh, a fair number of people, immigrants from uh, African communities. And many of these communities have ch churches around the district that uh, integrate their home traditions with their community here in the United States. That's part of the richness of, of our fabric, of our uh, of our nation. And I, I, I see uh, Alexander shaking your head. Sixty-seven languages spoken at this school. Yes, wow. Okay. wow. Sixty-seven languages spoken at this school. I account for one of them. <laughs> <laughs> that is the the diversity of our district. And uh, while I strongly believe in the separation of church and state, the foundation of our constitution, I also strongly believe that the foundations of our nation, of the mosaic faiths, the the ability of people to identify their faiths. Is we, we remarked earlier with uh, it's uh, the Jewish Sabbath today. Uh, people celebrate it today. Yesterday was uh, the Muslim Sabbath, the Sabbath, tomorrow's the Christian Sabbath. That all faiths have the ability to freely express their identity and celebrate their traditions, um, follow their faiths. That's what makes us strong as a nation. So I am fully committed to not just promoting that diversity, but, and it's a privilege, engaging and working to understand the di these different experiences. So I, I get to go and, and visit uh, the mosques, churches, and, and synagogues throughout my district, talk to the communities. Uh, before I came here, I had a meeting with the Greek community. This is what makes my job, for all of the tough things I do, and as a uh, new clerk, uh, you're going to experience that. Uh, it sometimes feels like a thankless job, but getting to represent and serve people, it, you have days that just you walk on air um, because you get to see what they're doing. So thank you for the question. Sorry. We'll stay in the front row. Hi, um, my name, uh, I don't, I've got a loud voice. I used to teach school. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you are nice, we're going to make you stand against the wall and just recess. So. In any case, my name is Diane Richards, and I want to say I voted for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, my, my comment and question isn't meant to offend anybody, but I can only speak from my heart. I am terrified of Donald Trump. I never, <laughs> and I'm not trying to be amusing. And I know some people feel very positive. I am beyond terrified. And 
Even my veterinarian yesterday was terrified, and she didn't charge me less, but we spoke to her concerns. And I'm not as knowledgeable as you are regarding the, the checks and balances. And um, I know you like the, the, the presidential campaign. He seems surprised still that he won. And he seems very random in his talking and decisions. And yesterday, Melania went in and tried to end the meeting with the Russian gentleman he was speaking with. I am so concerned about North Korea. And now he's talking about China. He's alienating everybody. Um, he's going like this, and he had this wonderful meeting with the German Chancellor. What is there in government that can safeguard some of his decision making? Because he fires everybody. <laughs> you know, Ivana, his daughter now, Ivanka, is being looked at because of her shoe business. He said, can you help me understand why his son-in-law was sent as a foreign relations representative to two countries when he's being investigated for the Russian, uh, his potential Russian involvement. I am absolutely terrified. I mean, I'm still going to pay my property taxes, come on. <laughs> but I'm afraid I'm going to be blown to smithereens. And I am being humorous about this, but it doesn't seem like there's real checks and balances. People that are in government, that I'm, I am working through TVs at one time, it doesn't seem like they have the same heart or efficacy that some years ago our representatives had. What is there in place so that um, he has to stand against the wall and, 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 and people can step in and make more? It's, it's, a, it's a very good question. It is a question I get all the time. What's your best answer? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I'll give you my only answer, and hopefully there's going to be good and yeah, some comfort in there, but also some discomfort, because I share your concerns. Uh, as I said in my opening remarks, this is a, a fraught time, and there are, are a lot of serious issues before us with people who may not fully appreciate or have the capacity to understand and uh, that makes me very nervous. On the other hand, there are a number of good people um, who are stepping up and, and I do believe, let me jump to the conclusion. But can he fire them? That's my concern. <laughs> yeah, so I, yes, he can. But I, that's I, 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 do, I do believe, let me jump to the conclusion. My conclusion is, A, we have been through worse times before, the Civil War, Great Depression, but World Wars. Alive. But we have, and we have survived those, we will survive this. I have no doubt, and I am no less optimistic about the future of our nation and the opportunities for our children. But I am very concerned about our, our present moment. They didn't have ballistic missiles during the Civil War. <laughs> I understand. And they didn't have people with the egos and the technical, technological communication capacity. You've got the president of North China, or North, North Korea, Korea, excuse me, who Treats us as a game. I, I, it's so no, I, 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 I'll challenge you. I don't think that the, the uh, uh, Chairman Kim Jong Un is treating it as a game. He's very rational, and he is looking this as what is necessary to protect his regime, and we have to look at it that way. So, some of the examples of, of why I say there are, are smart people. I've had the chance to um, uh, sit on some briefings, and some are classified, so I can't share all of it. But what I, what I can say about our Secretary of Defense, uh, General Mattis, is. He is looking at this from a multi-dimensional perspective and developing a strategy that is full of nuance and understands that we can't do it alone. We depend on our allies, South Korea, Japan, and more than anything else, we have to work with China because ultimately China holds the key to North Korea. North Korea, hands down, is the biggest risk we face at the moment. It is both urgent and... and uh, but he's threatening China. China. So we've got a president who kind of can give mixed signals. Uh, if you've ever been horseback riding, the first instruction is don't pull back on the reins and kick uh, from the stirrups at the same time. And uh, regrettably, the president is doing both of those in a, in a regular basis. And what you're seeing are people coming up and having to clean up behind him. Uh, I will tell you, Secretary of Defense Mattis understands, and I think he's doing a good job. We had a hearing in Foreign Affairs with Nikki Haley, the uh, UN Secretary. My take on 
things she had said in the past, her presentation in that hearing, she's just basically <coughs> doing her own thing. Mm -hmm. And her instincts so far are very good. And while she is representing the administration, she is not kowtowing to the administration. We need more people like that. But, and I said this on election day, or the day after the election, I've said it ever since, and it's, it's thank, thankfully the founding fathers were, were smart. Our government is more than the presidency. And the presidency is more than one person, although the president does have an awful lot of power. The checks and balances of the legislature, the judiciary, and the executive branch, while they're being tested and strained, they will survive. And I believe, I, I constantly scratch my head after the election, at various moments so far in the early uh, days of this administration, when the stock market seems to react opposite of how you would expect it to react. Okay. And I don't believe it's because they believe Donald Trump's going to be a, a great president. I'm, I'm giving the uh, markets a, a, a mind of its own, which may not entirely be fair. My assessment is that the markets remain strong because of confidence, global confidence, in the institution of our democracy. And that's why the Russian efforts to undermine our, our elections are so dangerous, because it is the institutions of our democracy. The fact that we have a republic, so states are able to make their own laws within the context and, and constraints of, of the Constitution, Within the constitutional structure, we have a legislature, ju judiciary, and an executive that are constantly at tension with each other. It slows things down, but that was, I believe, part of the wisdom of, of the founders in, in creating the system we have. We have to fight and protect that. Now, I will tell you, I'm extraordinarily frustrated with my colleague, colleagues on the Republican side in the House who are slow walking the investigation of the Russian uh, efforts to interfere in our elections. They have their reasons. It's hard to go against your own president. But the fact of the matter is those investigations are going to continue and ultimately will reach their conclusion. And whatever the conclusion is, will follow. Ultimately, we have to make sure that our elections are, are respected by the public, that the people who go to the polls have confidence in the outcomes that come out of those polls. That's vital, and that's up to everybody as a nation uh, to focus on. The most important thing we all can do and I'm including everyone in this room and everybody else, the fact that you're here, the fact that this is, help me, our 12th town hall, Megan? Yes. This is our 12th town hall. We've been all over the district. I'll continue to go around the district. It is probably our 20-something town hall style conversation. Yesterday we had a meeting about this size with people talking about health care. The day before we had a meeting about this size with people talking about small business. So some are general where I just take questions, some are topical. But the fact people are coming out gives me confidence that we're going to get through it. We have to make sure that people vote. We have to make sure that people call their representatives to talk about their priorities. We have to make sure that our young people are getting educated to think critically and get us through that. Am I scared? You betcha. Am I confident we'll get through it? I'm also confident. But it's going to take some hard work. And we're going to have some bad days. I had a horrible day a couple uh, weeks ago in the Judiciary Committee. I was talking in the meeting I had before, someone who was active in refugee rights. The Judiciary Committee was considering a, 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 a bad bill on refugees. A bad bill made even worse with an amendment that, would have, that will allow communities, if this becomes law, to hold referendums to say we don't want refugees in our communities. Think about the history of our nation. And part of the, the history is that people come and they say, oh, right, we're here. We don't want the Irish, we don't want the Jews, yeah. we don't want the yeah. people from Mexico. They can go through and say all of those. The fact of the matter is that every wave of immigration has made our country stronger. Mm -hmm. And that as a nation, as we look at people who are struggling and people who are suffering, the fact that we have lived the sentiment expressed on the Statue of Liberty, I think defines us as a nation. And my goal is to make sure we continue. Unfortunately, that amendment passed. The bill will come to the House. I'll vote against the bill when it gets to the House, but that, that's what we're facing. So, our host. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm Alexander Brook, and I'm very, I'm a teacher too, so I'm yeah. loud. So, <laughs> um, I'm very proud um, to be representing uh, East Main District 63, and we also have an educator that's in this district, a former educator of another, I trust another district. Obviously, public education is something that is very near and dear to my heart. 
Um, as you can see from our students visiting them, they're amazing. What we do in public schools is absolutely amazing. Um, additionally, I'm a teacher in Chicago, um, and so we're threatened with the proliferation of charter schools every single day. Um, in addition to being frightened by the president, I'm also very frightened by his secretary of education. Um, so um, I'm very concerned that the um, trend, the policy is all for vouchers and for privatizing schools and what's going to happen to these students and to public education if these policies and bills get passed. Thank you. First, thank you for what you do as a teacher, what you do as a uh, school board. Uh, my, I mentioned my two boys, 24 and 22. Both of my sons had IEPs when they were in school. Both of my sons succeeded through, well, they survived middle school, <laughs> succeeded through high school. They uh, have gone on to college, and none of their success would have been possible without the commitment, dedication, hard work, and love of their teachers. And so um, I, I wouldn't be where I am without, without my teachers. So I understand that, and I am fully committed to the idea of public education, that every one of our children, regardless of where she is born, where she grows up, should have access to education that will give every one of our kids the opportunity to succeed. Stay by the bell, I'm done. <laughs> well, to succeed as adults. And succeeding as adults isn't just finding a job, it's being confident as you raise your children, being able to watch the news and make your own judgment. So it is a broad-based uh, um, education that, that our children need. I have Look, I opposed the appointment of Betsy DeVos. If I had had a vote in the Senate, I would have voted against Betsy DeVos, as did 50 of my Senate colleagues. Uh, it took extraordinary in the appointment of a cabinet official. It took a tie break by the vice president to, to bring her on board. In her remarks, in her testimony, in her what she's focused on since, I think she's demonstrated clearly that she's unqualified for this position, and, and we need to be watchful and concerned about that. For better or worse, education takes place locally. And so I, I do believe the system is resilient, but it's, it's going to be challenged. Um, you know, with respect to charter schools, the idea, the original idea of charter schools as laboratories, as a place to experiment, it makes sense. Let's find these ways to get these ideas and get them into the rest of our public schools. Which also, by the way, means as a laboratory, we're going to hold charter schools to a higher standard, not even the equal or lower standard, but a higher standard because they are at the cutting edge. In the military, we've become very good at taking lessons from a battlefield over here and getting them disseminated fairly quickly. We know how to, to do this. We need to bring that into our, our education system. And I think that's one of the roles that the uh, federal Department of Education can provide as that disseminator of ideas and best practices promoting opportunities and making sure all our kids are, are getting a good education. We're not seeing that from the administration. Uh, I'm not on the Workforce Education Committee. Uh, my co dear colleague next door, uh, Raj Krishnamurthy, is. Uh, we work very closely and, and talk about this a lot. Um, I am fully committed to supporting our teachers, supporting our schools. Uh, I looked at vouchers in depth about 25 years ago, and at that point came away with the assessment that it's going to be really hard to implement a voucher program that doesn't is not detrimental to our school system. In the 25 years since, it, the assessment I had has been demonstrated in, in experience as even worse than what we thought then. I, I'm not a supporter of vouchers. So. <laughs> I'm the gentleman in the back. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, Marty. Congressman, just a simple question. From the time you got to Washington, here, here I can say this, have you ever decided for yourself to go to the National Rifle Association and talk to the top? <laughs> talk to the top chairman and ask him to sit on down with you, 
Simple question. Uh -huh. And let, can we ever get a solution with this gun problem from you to, to like you, a simple congressman, and to the United States so we can kind of get a better handle on this violence, illness, disease, everything that is out of control? Thank you. Um, Marty, Marty. Marty, it's, it's a great question. The, the short answer is I've not had a ch chance to talk to Wayne LaPierre. I don't think he would have any willingness to sit down and talk to me. <laughs> However, I have spoken to quite a few members of the NRA, locally and around the country. <coughs> Great conversations. You know, my position on, on guns is that we need common sense policy, common sense legislation that takes steps to reduce gun violence in our nation. There is no one simple solution to this. There is no one singular problem to this. Right? If you talk, talk about, you know, I, I believe we should have true universal background checks. Right? So that people who shouldn't have guns can't get guns. But even a simple statement like that has different facets to it because you have criminals, you have gangsters, which I'll put into a different category. Right, right. You have terrorists. But you also have people with mental illness. You have people with a history of domestic violence. And the, to me, the simplest one, which isn't necessarily background checks, it's, it's gun safety and, and trigger locks and things like that. Every week, there's another story of a toddler getting a hold of a, a loose weapon left by a relative or a friend and someone getting killed. There's a story of the woman driving her car and her gun slides behind the back seat. The kid picks it up and shoots through the back of the seat, killing his mother. Right? There are simple things we can do to address that, but there's no one thing to address all of those. So I, I do believe there's things we can do. I've had these conversations, we've had forums where we've had people from the, the gun uh, rights community, NRA, people from gun safety community, and at the end of the hour we walk away and everyone says, yeah, we all agree. So it's the leadership, it is the Wayne LaPierre's, it's the gun lobby, it's the manufacturers who are, who are stopping uh, common sense progress that can, can address this challenge. I'd like to add one thing to that, Congressman. It's also like what you're saying, with all this violence, this is adding to, this is the climax of our health care rising. Doctors every day of the week, because I come from nursing. I'm from the Veterans Administration, retired and, and all that. And I was, by the way, up in Great Lakes, North Chicago. Oh, thank you. I lived 25 years, Park City, then went to Zion and all that. But but, but this is like the little thing, like the like if I asked you for a penny, sure, take a penny, this is the penny problem, we got everything else, and we never get addressed. Nurses working overtime, doctors working overtime, uh, one thing after another, plus we got five other diseases in the way. Right. And, it's a, and all this is exclusive. combined, we it can't, we, we, we mean to get a handle. Thank you, you hand up when I come to you. Actually, I have a couple of questions which didn't bounce on Medicare, Social Security. Um, I've been on Medicare for a while. And I guess I'm the only one in here that has <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And I'm reaching <laughs> another decade in two weeks. Ouch. However, um, we, I haven't had an increase in Social Security for its two years. My health care is going up. Of Medicare, my supplemental insurance is going up. And I really wonder, in the state of Illinois, Social Security, what happens to the money for people who die before they're 62 and 65? There's money that they put in. Where does that money go? I, I'm kind of a pessimist when it comes to the state having no money. Um, where does that money go? I'm kind of concerned because we never have any money. And the same thing I feel with some our lottery. They don't have money to pay people who win. Where does the money go? I'm just very concerned that it's going in someone's pocket. <laughs> As I'm sure a lot of us agree. And. Um, it really bothers me because I can't know, I can't live on just social security. I don't have some other means of income. It's too bad. And just to mention, I oh okay, sorry. 
I have four grandchildren, two of whom are, one is 28, one is 24. They were very reluctant about voting in the presidential election. And I said, you have to vote. Grandma, I don't like either of the candidates. But I'll, I'll touch on all those. And they refused to vote. What kind of a message does right. that send? And, uh, thank you. Thank you. So let me, um, the, the, the three pieces of the question, the part about uh, the state, I don't have, I don't know. I'm just, I don't want to answer without uh, having the, the specific knowledge of what's doing that. I did read in the paper, I think yesterday, that the lottery is selling tickets again out of the budget. But, uh, but I, I just don't know the answer, so I don't want to answer, uh, give you an incomplete answer. As far as uh, Social Security, let me talk about Social Security, Medicare, senior issues in, in general. Um, this is, I think, one of the strengths of our last century, is the way we have gone from a nation, or decided as a nation, to take care of uh, the generations that serve us and work for us and sacrifice for their children and grandchildren. Before Social Security, half of all seniors were destined to live in poverty in the final years. Uh, before Social Security, life expectancy was uh, 63. Mm -hmm. uh, we're at a point today where we're down, we've brought it down to 10% of seniors living in poverty, still too many, but much better than 50%. And life expectancy for a child born today is 8, right? and over time that's been continuing, continuing to increase. And that's, those are all things we should be very proud of and promises that we need to work to keep. Now within the broad uh, breadth of our nation, there are, are, are variances, and there's a, a, a number of people who, who think that we should privatize Social Security and Medicare. I think that's wrong. I don't support those policies. I think these are promises, and uh, as the vagaries of the market go up and down, independent of that, if you're paying in Social Security, you should know you're going to get your payment, and that, that'll be there. Some people want to raise the eight retirement age. It's already gone, going up to 67. Some people want to raise it to 70. And if you forgive me, I'm a numbers guy, so I'll, I'll, I'll use my numbers on this one. But uh, if you take my year, I'm 55, you take the population of 55-year-olds and break it down by how much they're earning right now, the top 20% have a life expectancy of 88, the bottom 20% have a life expectancy of 76. There's a lot of reasons for that difference. Access to health care, type of work they're doing, um, decisions made. That's not important. The fact is the numbers. If you raise the retirement age from 67 to 70 for this age group, what it means is that the people who are earning the least, the people who are going to be dependent the most on Social Security, you've taken away a third of their expected lifetime benefit. Because they have a nine year life expectancy after 67 and we've taken away three years. That's just morally wrong. Now, I think we can do things to create incentives for those who want to work longer before they take Social Security. God bless them. Let's give them the chance. My dad's 83. He'll be 84 in September. He's still working. He's a consultant. It's not backbreaking work. But the guys who are working in factories or the folks who are uh, working in our, in our community on construction, that's backbreaking work. And making it to 67 is going to be a stretch. So we're, we're a smart nation. I think we can address this. We need to address it. But we can do it in a way that doesn't put the burden on those who struggle the most. And, and so that's, I feel very, very strongly about that. And we'll work to, to continue it to It just to bothers me that how many people have friends that have died. You can read the obituaries constantly. And people die 20, 30, 40, 50 that have put into Social Security. I want to know what happens. So I, I can't, I can't speak directly to it, but I, can talk, I spent some time in insurance. And I, I, I can, I can, yeah. Social Security is going broke. So, it, it, um, well, it's not, first of all, it's not picture. going broke. Uh, okay. we, need, we need to strengthen it, but it is, is, is not going broke. But um, I know in insurance that if 1,025 uh, year olds buy insurance, the actuaries understand that of those 1,000, some are going to live past age 100 but some are never going to make it to age 50, and that's just mm -hmm. life. 
Um, all the money going in is spread out and the risk is shared. You don't know who's going to live long and who's not going to live long, and, and that's just some of the risk. I can't say that that's the way it works here, but uh, my guess is that that is probably built in on, onto that. So um, thank you for the question. Over the corner. Congressman, this is more of a political question than it is a governing or a policy question. The lady before was talking about checks and balances. It seems to me that the best check and balance that can exist in this era is if the Democratic Party retakes control of Congress. <laughs> and there's a midterm election coming up that, you know, they keep talking it's a year and a half away. It's not. The primary is what? Eight months? And then in the 2020 elections, the congressional maps are going to get reset. And I keep hearing all this talk about the Democratic Party is trying to reinvent itself and they're going to do this and they're going to do that. And there's been five special elections and they lost them all. Granted, not by as much as they usually do, but they lost them all. What is the Democratic Party doing to better position itself to capitalize on these two elections in this era of Trump so that the check and balance is there? And given that it might be difficult to accomplish everything, what's the single most important thing that can come out of it? I would advocate that it's retaking control of the system, <coughs> putting the 60 vote threshold back in on all these nominations so that when Justice Kennedy retires or Justice Ginsburg's die, Justice Ginsburg dies, or whatever the case may be, we're not going to get two or three more of these ridiculous appointments. So what, what, is, what is the Democratic Party doing to position itself to make that happen now? I, I am so excited to answer that question. I just can't do it here. The reason I can't do it here is I'm here in my official capacity. So we can talk about it, I just can't talk about it. In the I'd love to capacity. talk to you about it. After. However, I realize I forgot to answer the question Faith asked about voting. And so I'm going to answer that, which touches on, on what you said. And I'll start with a joke because one of my, and this I can say, one of my favorite uh, memes was Dear Justice Ginsburg. If it's a kidney, a heart, anything you need, take mine. <laughs> so, so, no, but the, the, the best thing we can do to address the checks and balances is make sure people vote. I said this earlier. And the, the biggest frustration I have, and it's not just 24 and 28 year olds. I talked to 50 year olds and 60 year olds who says, I'm not voting because I don't like the choices we have. Well, first answer is the choices we have are the choices we have. I'm a teacher, that's a tautology. Right? If I'm in it. But the fact of the matter is, we're choosing between A and B. And our choices, and this is very important when you talk to people, our choices are not between arsenic and cyanide. <coughs> our choices are between who's going to lead us. And to say it's just picking poison, I don't want to pick my poison, it's not. There are real differences. And we have to make sure that our children, our grandchildren, our parents, our coworkers understand that the vote matters. And if we have a higher turnout for voting, we're going to have better outcomes. And the example I use is one of the communities, communities in my district a few years ago had more people get library cards yeah. than vote for mayor. Yeah. That just isn't right. We need everyone to feel that. And that's a responsibility for all of us. Um, but that, to me, is the biggest check and ba balance. And if we get that, then I think you will have that balance. And you didn't ask this, but I've been thinking about it, so I'll share this thought as well. Um, you know, there's, there's talk about moving from the Electoral College to a popular vote for president. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's pros and cons on both sides. This is one of those arguments where you can really play fiddler on the roof all day long. Because yes, in this case, last election, uh, Hillary Clinton got more popular vote. Donald Trump came on the Electoral College. That's happened before in our history. Significant consequences to that. But if we had a popular vote, then Texas, Florida, California, New York would overwhelmingly control that vote. But I'll share this with you and put it in context. I don't have the answer, but I'm looking for other thoughts, so I'm sharing it with you. I heard on the radio last week that 70% of the nation's population live in 15 states. Those are the 15 states with the largest cities, so that makes sense. What that means is that those 70% of the population are represented in the Senate by 30 senators, and 70% or 30% of the population are rep represented in the Senate by 70 senators, because each state has two senators. That was the compromise made by the founders that uh, uh, balanced the representation by state and represent representation by population. And that makes sense. But with that imbalance of influence, maybe going to a popular vote can balance that out. I don't know the answer, but uh, those, those, these are the things I think about while I lie, why, why I'll, I lie awake worrying about our future. Um, and, 
and that's what we do. You've been anxiously yeah, waiting. Yes, um, thanks, Representative Schneider. Okay, I'll stay here. Thanks for coming. Thanks for calling on me. Thanks for giving us a chance to speak. Um, we have to get rid of the tax loopholes. All right, we don't have the privilege of putting whatever number we want for our savings. Rauner, he put one billion. He has forty-four billion. All right, so that means he didn't pay taxes, I guess, on thirty on uh, forty-three billion dollars. We saw what Trump did. Somehow, he lost. A million dollars a thousand times and he has booming hotels golf courses resorts so, so he doesn't pay taxes question. for 15 years so okay let, 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 We're gonna, let, let me finish I got some issues <laughs> all right close the loopholes this is sick also no assault weapons sold to the public if they don't get into Congress they are not protecting the citizens and get out <laughs> write them up, impeach them, get out. No assault weapons sold to the public. We want daily positive stock returns. We're not an idiot. Nokia has 13 trillion in assets. Chase Bank has 6 trillion in assets besides the money deposits. We want to be paid correctly as middle class shareholders, mutual fund holders. We want to be so paid correctly. Have, uh, no, get, get rid of the indexes. The get rid of the, okay. We want income. With income, we'll purchase more goods and services. This will create jobs. People have income paid for their medical insurance and will get off of Medicaid. This will reduce violence. We want to stop paying for irresponsible women and their partners and their abortions. We pay for them. So, so we don't want to be paid for them. Not, all right, them. all right. And also immigrants, we want no immigration down. laws and there won't be any right. illegal Susan, immigration. Okay, sorry. take down care down. of those issues, please. All right. and, we, and don't want, we don't want to be paying for those millions of abortions. Right. They're irresponsible. They need to grow up and take control. Okay. Okay. Um, so let me let me take that and just touch on, on uh, an important issue that she brought up, which is, is the need for tax reform and, and tax loopholes. Our tax code was last uh, modified in 1986. We desperately need tax reform, but it has to be both corporate and individual. It has to address all of us, not only the most fortunate, not only the corporations. Uh, this is something I'm privileged to be part of. Something called the New Dem Coalition. I'm a co-chair of the. Um, Task Reform Task Force, <coughs> slowly because it's a tongue twister, but uh, uh, this is, I'm working with colleagues on both sides. Uh, Paul Ryan has a proposal that uh, is giving heartburn to everybody. <laughs> I'm not sure what, where that goes, but I am very cautious about it and concerned. Uh, what we need to do is make sure that it's not tax cuts for those who are most fortunate and putting the burden on those who struggle the most. One of my issues with the health care bill coming out of the Senate, the health bill that passed the House, it's a tax reform package. It is not a health care bill. You know, we need health care. We need to make sure that all Americans have quality, affordable health care near where they live, when they need it, from doctors and nurses and professionals that they trust. This is what we have to do, and uh, this is what I'm working for. So, please. Yeah, um, I guess this is both a hard question and an easy question. I'm the only answer to easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. The, thank you for holding this meeting. Uh, there's going to be a vote on a $695 billion appropriation for the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. That seems this a little week. rich to me. I mean, currently it's, what, $600 billion? <coughs> and I'd like to see, well, you could address your feelings about the balance between the military spending and, you know, everything else. Um, where's the easy part? Yeah. So, so you're going to vote this week. Yeah. So yeah. there is a vote this week um, on the uh, um, uh, national defense appropriation, uh, or it's actually the authorization, it's not the appropriation. Authorization, it's the authorization, and the uh, uh, House Arms Committee uh, did pass this. Uh, there was one no vote, almost unanimously bipartisan. I don't think the number is 695, I think it's lower, but not by much. I don't know what the number is. I, my recollection is it's like 621, but it's a big plus up in numbers, but I, I could be wrong. But it, uh, it, it, it's a big plus up. Our military is being asked to do more around the world in more complex situations. We're putting greater demands. We have to have a broader conversation of what we expect from our military and what we're trying to uh, accomplish. Um, We've got, you didn't ask this, but I'll, I'll, I'll go there. We, we, uh, we are operating under an authorization for the use of military force in AUMF 
that dates back to the Iraq War. Uh, we are using that to conduct operations in multiple nations outside of Iraq. We have to have that debate. Uh, I, I also fundamentally believe that we need to make sure that those we are asking to put their lives on the line and by the way, as I say that, I'm not just talking about our men and women in military uniform, but our men and women serving in our diplomatic corps, serving in USAID, who also are putting their lives in and giving their lives in support of our nation, that when we ask them to go out further abreast, farther afield, to put their lives out there for us, that we are doing it with the resources and commitments they deserve. That means not funding platforms that nobody wants, but has constituencies here, here at home. It means making hard decisions. It means having the conversation. I don't believe it's a debate between guns and butter. I am not willing to let it be a debate where you talk about, first of all, sequester, really dumb idea. I don't know if I can be any clearer on that. But remember, it was created to be such a bad idea that no one would accept it. And the predecessors that I were in Congress before I got there accepted it. Here we are, we've got this problem. I am not willing to give up the idea that we'll cut our programs here at home to fund our defense. We have to have a broader discussion. Tax reform, up, by the way, has to be a part of it. If we're gonna ask folks to put their lives on the line to protect our nation, we need to make sure they have resources. It is not a choice between defending our nation and raising our children, serving our seniors, helping those who are in need, addressing our opioid crisis, dealing with health care, and you can go on down the line. And that's the challenge. Donald Trump found it out pretty quickly. It only took him four months to discover it's hard and complicated. <laughs> it's all right and complicated. That's why uh, my colleagues and I are elected to deal with that. So thank you. So um, my name's uh, Sonia, and I did travel all the way from Vernon Hills thank to you. ask this question. Is um, I, I feel like the uh, it's about health care. I, I probably loud enough. I feel it's a, I feel it's about health care, and I feel the discussion is constantly about health insurance, and the paradigm needs to shift, and it's really about health care. And um, single-payer system has been working in every other um, first world country. What is your, first of all, what is your um, take on that, and where do you stand? And second of all, I will add that I've become increasingly discouraged since 2008 when I watched the, have a supermajority and they uh, moved away from single payer. And then what just happened in California, where you know for years the Democrats uh, advocated for single payer until now they had a Democratic president, a, a governor, and they shelved it for a year. And uh, so to someone like me who's been a lifelong Democrat, uh, progressive, whatever you want to call it, uh, I feel um, I feel betrayed by the Democratic Party in many ways. And I understand the young people. I'm I'm in that 50 year old category that. I made the choice to vote, I sort of voted for you, I did vote for Hillary, but, but it was really like a rock and a hard place. And anyway. So, okay. uh, <laughs> great question. And if we could start over, if I had a blank sheet of paper in a room full of really smart people of how best to deliver health care. The easiest thing to say is I wouldn't do it the way we have. <laughs> and, and single payer would absolutely be one of the paths you look at. Other nations do have it. I, I get asked this question every, everywhere I go. Canada is a, a single payer multi-provider. Britain's a single payer single provider. You've got Germans, Germany's model. Different nations have, have different models. Mm -hmm. There are pros and cons to all of them. I think the other thing that probably everyone can agree on we're never going to find perfection. The goal is always progress. And if I move to the progress, unfortunately, before I was born, before most of us were born, there was a decision in this country to set up health care through the corporation. And there were, there's a long history that explains why that happened. It is where we are. And 85% of Americans uh, are getting their insurance right now through their employer and getting good insurance. I had a woman in my office yesterday who told the story, she works for government, uh, a, a local government. She was a happy ending. Born, son born with half a heart. With what? Half a heart. Oh, okay. and, and by the way, diagnosed in utero. So they knew this. 
had heart open heart surgery in his first year, got a heart transplant in his second year, got a baby sister in his third year, and he's doing great. But that doesn't happen without the health insurance you have. So you're 100% right the debate we've been having up to now is overwhelmingly, not exclusively, but overwhelmingly about health insurance. Without health insurance, you don't have real access to, to quality health care. So it's an important piece, but we have to de deal with the health care issue as well. And we have to do it while keeping the example of, of rebuilding the highway while keeping, while keeping traffic flowing. And that's what makes single payer so hard. The public option was something that was talked about in 2009 that was desired and, by the way, expected. The House was advocating for it. Uh, and you go and look at the history and the back and forth, the ping pong that was, and that's what they call it, ping pong between the House and the Senate, that got derailed ultimately by the, the death of Senator Kennedy and then the, the loss of that seat to uh, Scott Brown as a Republican literally changed everything. And many of the bells and whistles that are put on legislation to satisfy different um, constituencies that come off when it gets cleaned out, those things ended up in the bill because they couldn't clean it up because of reconciliation. That gets very much in, into the weeds. I don't want to start this conversation over. We've seen how hard it is with the Affordable Care Act. Affordable Care Act's not perfect, but it has a lot of successes. We've achieved a lot. It's got flaws that we have to fix, and some that there are no fixes for. We have to try something else to do. But to go back to the drawing board and start over, I think, is, is, is the wrong path. So ultimately, I'd like to get, I know what my goals are, and I think we can all share the goals, is that everyone in this country has health care as a right, not a privilege, that that health care is good health care, that's affordable, that it's not determinative by where you live or how much you earn, and, and that you can go to doctors you trust. Well, I have one thing that I want to add to that, though. So as, as a middle class person, though, I have employed, I have health insurance, I used to have a great HMO, everything was taken care of. But right now, at this moment, God help me if something happens to anyone in my family, because my deductibles and my premium, my, not my premiums, my deductibles and my, uh, the 80%, 20 whatever they're doing, it's so high that, that, that if, if anything happens to anyone in my family, uh, we're, we're thousands of dollars right. in debt. And, and, and so the good news is that without lifetime caps, people aren't condemned to bankruptcy with a, 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 a diagnosis. The challenge is, and I am going to be partisan on this one, the Republicans have been kicking the legs out of yeah, the agree. Affordable Care Act so that we are in a situation where the individual markets are, are fragile. You know, Senator McConnell, who's driving the bus right now, said, look, if I can't get my way, yeah, we're going to have to go back and figure out how to fix the damage we've done with the, the individual markets. The, the deductibles are high, the premiums are high. We need to work to bring the cost of health care in this country down and make the accessibility more available to people. We live in the center of, of health care access. Imagine living in rural America where you, know, you may have the money through coverage or, or personally, but you're not going to have the doctor to go to. That's you right. have to drive hours for uh, just basic health care. <coughs> And for, for specific needs, you're going to have to leave the state. These are, are real challenges. So, um, thank you. Um, my name is Barry. Uh, a follow up on that. Um, most time we're, we talk about how do we pay for the rising, how do we pay for the rising cost of health care? I know I realize we're in a capitalist country, and everybody has the right to charge whatever the heck they want. And hopefully get, you know, if, if, you're, if you want my service, you're going to have to pay me. But we don't talk about how do we lower or the cost, not how do we pay for the rising cost, but how do we stop the rising cost? Because that's, the insurance, will, it'll constantly, constantly go up. If the insurance companies are going to pay for it, they're going to keep charging. So mm -hmm. just keep doing this the whole time, unless so, this. So part Canada can control their pr prescription drugs. We can't um, seem to do that. So let's talk about uh, services on competition pharmaceuticals in uh, a second. But with services, and we have a model of fee for service. Part of the effort of ACA, and it was a step, it wasn't the, the solution, is how do we move away from this fee, fee for service environment? If 
I'm a physician and I'm paid for every procedure I do. If I'm gonna maximize my income, I'm gonna maximize the number of procedures I do. And if I'm a hammer, everything is gonna look like a nail. And you come, come in to me and I say, oh, gotta do surgery, oh, gotta do surgery. whatever it is. That's part, part, significant part of what's driving up uh, the costs. Uh, another piece of it is the um, uh, inconsistencies of the, or within the system. So you need an MRI, MRI. You go to the hospital and it costs this much. You go across the street to the clinic and it, it's a fraction of that. Mm -hmm. And why is that and, and how to get it? But maybe the bigger question is, why do we have an MRI, an expensive MRI machine here, here, and here in three locations in the same community that are half capacity, so if we're charging more to fill them, when we can't get an MRI out to the rural, those are some of the discontinuities, uh, if you will, in the market. And that was barely touched on in the first round. And I really do believe the ACA was, was the first round. Healthcare is something we're going to have to deal with constantly. In the seven years since ACA passed, healthcare is, has moved forward, policy is not. We have to work to keep our policy um, consistent with that. Uh, the pharmaceuticals is, is more complicated. Um, other countries control the price of pharmaceuticals. We, we don't hear it, and, and you, you talked about that. Um, other countries limit access, but there's a reason that pharmaceuticals are, are not, uh, new drugs are not created in, in some of these other countries. We have to recognize a couple of things when we work to develop policies that address it. Diseases don't recognize borders, right? They, they travel, they, they don't, you know, they, they aren't specific to where you're from or, or uh, how much you earn, what your government is. If we're going to tackle these diseases, you're seeing in the pharmaceutical, in pharmaceutical industry is becoming an increasingly global industry. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But policy needs to be, be developed around that. Countries that protect intellectual property are where these products are, are being developed. But in, in, in some cases, you're going to see that those countries are also the ones being taken advantage of some of the products. If you were a casting agent, you would never accept someone with the description of Martin Shkreli as a, a character. <laughs> Remember, he's the guy who bought the drug and was selling it for uh, 900 times what it was uh, previously. He was a bad actor. And there are too many bad actors in the industry, but not most of the industry. We've got to deal with the bad actors. We've got to promote this innovation. If we're going to lower the cost, I don't care whether it is on medications, on medical devices, on, on the way we deliver care, it's going to all come from innovation if we're going to bring down price. We've done it in other industries. Uh, how many of you have a smartphone with you? Right? The, the storage on your smartphone is measured in um, gigabytes. And it's, I, I, I'm assuming, unless you were sold a, a bill of goods, that everyone paid less than $1,000 for your smartphone. I'm picking that number because when I first got into the technology industry in 1984, $1,000 was a 10 megabyte hard drive. Mm -hmm. okay. we've, we've made great progress. We need to bring that innovation and ability to drive down the cost of healthcare. That's how we're going to get there. The partisan fighting you're seeing on it, both sides saying our way or no way, what? is the bias. We have to find a way. When you say innovation, do you mean competition? Competition drives innovation. That's a piece of it. Because if you have that intellectual property and you've got a patent on it, there is no competition. A patent on it for a limited time. Yeah, well, seven, how long? 17 years. Uh, not on, on uh, medical, it's less than 17. But on, so on pharmaceuticals, how long? I think seven years. Seven years? Seven years. Yeah. And, it's, and, and that's their ability to get a return on their investment. And, but when you have competition, and one problem you have is you have one drug and then only one other. I want, if, when it goes on generic, you want to have multiple generic players in the marketplace. We need to have that. We need to make sure we have safety. One of the problems with importing that we have to figure out a way to address is there's a blind spot. Right? I know if a drug's brought into this country, many of the drugs we buy are made out outside of the country, but there is um, uh, custody of those drugs is controlled the entire way. If you ever lose sight of the custody of control, you have a safety issue. And in many of these drugs, you're talking life and death. And, and so we need to make sure that, that we have that safety. If it was easy, we would have solved it already. It is hard, but 
we're making the easy things hard with the partisanship. And if you make the easy things hard, the hard becomes impossible. And that's why I believe we've got to find this bipartisan, uh, getting people in the room and talking to each other. And I've got one last question signal from Megan. We're, we're actually past the time. So it's in the spider cloud. I'm going to give it to uh, you. Uh, Teresa, um, I know that you have been a leader and very outspoken about environmental issues. Um, and I thank you for that. I thank you for a lot of the outspoken leadership that you have given as my representative. Um, I know the Great Lakes restoration is a big issue that you support. Has there been any movement on that? And then um, how do we stop stop <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> Does anyone else have another question? <laughs> so I have the answer to the first part of the question, and I, I hate to tell you what it is. When I was in Congress the first time, uh, the Republican Congress cut the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. So the Great Lakes, five Great Lakes, largest uh, freshwater uh, body of water on, on the uh, globe, 20% of the freshwater in the world, eight states, uh, five lakes, eight states, 30 million people depend upon it, uh, under all kinds of threats. The Republicans cut the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding by a third. I was proud to be part of a group of, of members who were able to get that fully restored in the 113th Congress. Uh, in the 115th now, where I'm back, the President has the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative clearly in his sights. We were appalled that he was going to cut it by 90%. Mm -hmm. That gets worse. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. He's zero now. So where things stand now, if nothing changed, if the president gets his way, there will be no funds for, for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Uh, I'm going to do everything I can to fight that. I've spoken out against that. Uh, I'll come back and leave you with a, a light story because we have to keep hope and keep our, our sense of humor. But um, it's not just the Great Lakes that's under assault. Uh, Scott Pruitt, the appointment to the EPA, is committed on um, disassembling the EPA. The morale, in the EPA mor morale in many administrative agencies is low. I think it is lowest among EPA workers because they really feel they're getting assaulted from their leadership. And uh, so we need to work to protect them. There is rumors that he's going to try to close the Region 5 office, which covers <laughs> Illinois and other Midwestern states. That would be um, a, a, a terrible decision. And with my colleagues in Illinois and the other Midwestern states, we have written to the administration saying, please don't do this, and we'll, we'll continue to do that, to, to speak out. And that's how we stopped Scott Pruitt. Uh, he, if we don't say anything, if we let him nibble away at the edges or slash away in big chunks, he will do away with our environmental protections. Mm -hmm. uh, as those of us in our 50s and above, we can remember the Cuyahoga River on fire. Yeah. We can remember, it's not just the, the our rivers and our air. Remember the commercial with uh, the um, Native American yeah. climbing a hill near the top of the highway with the anti-litter ad, one of the best mm -hmm. campaigns ever with the Indian tribe. We're much better. Our kids don't see that in commercial because we're taking care of our environment. Better. Not perfect, but better. We're going in the right direction. I led a, uh, a resolution. My team put it together. We reached out. We got so far 180 some, 83, 85. People have added on. Unfortunately, all Democrats condemning the president's decision to pull out of the Paris Accord. But you know who hasn't pulled out of the Paris Accord? Governors, mayors, village presidents, corporate leaders. Mm -hmm the employees and citizens of those communities and workers of those corporations. And that's how we defeat Scott Pruitt. We can say, you can have your misguided beliefs and your false science. And we're going to work to make sure that we protect our planet. And so I said I'll leave you. First, let me say thank you. And again, thank you to the middle school. Thank you for being here and sharing this time. I know I can't get to everyone's questions, but I appreciate you being here and, and, and sharing your, your ear and your ideas. Um, I was going to the floor to speak about the rumor that the president was going to cut the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative by 90%. And you have one minute speeches at the end of the day, anyone can speak about anything. And it's, it's just whoever comes, you sit in a seat and they go, first come, first serve. So I was sitting next to a colleague, Dan Kildee from uh, Michigan. He represents Flint, by the way, where we had the issue with the Flint water. 
And he said, what are you speaking about? He was speaking about Flint, talking about that. I was talking about Great Lakes. And he said, you know, it's Great Lakes week. I said, get out of here. He says, no, really. I said, I've never heard of such a thing. So I look it up on my phone. And not only was it Great Lakes week, this was on Wednesday, but Thursday, the next day, was Great Lakes Day. <laughs> now, when we go to the Florida to speak, these are prepared remarks more often than not. We've worked with it on a team. We've done our fact checks. And uh, when a member goes to the floor when I'm speaking, my staff will have the TV on and they're anxiously watching. So they see me come up and they get, they hear me talking and saying why the Great Lakes are so important. Eight lakes, 30 million people. And I said, and tomorrow, of all days on Great, Lake, Great Lakes Day, which was the improv part, and all of a sudden my staff looks at each other and says, he just created a national holiday. That's <laughs> <laughs> what to totally uh, so, it's, it's, there are moments of humor in this very stark time. And we have to keep our, our, our wits about it and stay engaged and stay in the fight. Uh, I say half jokingly that we are where we are because John Stewart retired. <laughs> <laughs> the half joking part about it was if you go back and, and read the news from before he, re he retired, he had achieved the status as most trusted news source mm -hmm. in America. John Stewart wasn't news, he was satire. Mm -hmm. But if our 24 and 28 and 55 year olds are getting our news mm -hmm. from satire, first of all, they're missing the joke because you have to have read the news to understand the humor in what John Stewart was saying. <laughs> but we need to make sure that we are watching what's going on, staying alert to what's going on, but recognizing that we are bigger than anything that's happening in Washington and stronger here at home. And that if people stand up and educate our kids, thank you. Fight for our environment, thank you. Fight for health care. If we continue to do that, it's not going to be easy. Victories over the next couple of years are going to be days we hold the line as much as days we go forward. And there are going to be days that we're knocked uh, on our keisters. But as long as we <laughs> <laughs> what I love is the, the clocks, because we've managed our days so tightly, it is the 1221 bell. Not the 1221 bell, it's the 1221 bell. Um, but as long as we get back up, we're going to be OK. So I promise you we're going to get through this. I just also share your concerns. So thank you guys very much.